I'm Mark. And I'm Josh. And this is Alter Ego Comics TV for the week of December 14th, 2016. Coming to you from Alter Ego Comics in Lima, Ohio. And one of the questions we get week in, week out, both in the shop and via email, Facebook, all over the place, what should I read? So that's why we do this. Every week, Josh and I read a giant stack of comics on the new, new comic book day eve. The day, the night before comics come out. Also known as Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday night, we come back Wednesday morning and shoot this before we open the shop and tell you what we really liked. And the book I like the most this week is Daredevil, number 14, written by Charles Soule, artwork by Ron Garney. This is part five of the storyline called Dark Art, and it is dark, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is a very dark Daredevil story, kind of a throwback to the uh, Frank Miller Brian Michael Bendis days. We've we've less left the happy go lucky Mark Wade run in the dust, and this is Daredevil and his uh, apprentice Blind Spot going up against his name Muse. I don't remember his name. I believe it's Muse. It is Muse. I love that band. Um, who is an Inhuman and is a freaky serial killer at the same time. And this story has been so so good. I've re referenced it many times and. Uh, said how much I was enjoying it. This is, I believe, the... Bear with me here. An ultimate? It is the last part. It is the, oh, okay. the last part of the storyline. And stuff happens in this issue. So I don't know what else to tell you. If you're not reading it, you might want to wait for the trade at this point or go find the single issues if you can. Uh, but it was very impressive. I love this team on Daredevil, and I can't wait to see what happens next. My pick of the week is Hawkeye, number one, uh, written by Kelly Thompson with art by Leonardo Romero and just Leonardo Romero, colorist Jordi Belair. They're getting cover credit now. It confuses me. Everybody's me. on the cover. Um, it's a union thing. Yes. My favorite thing about this cover is the it's $399. Cents, I know. That not was... uh, $399. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kate Bishop, the Lady Hawkeye from Young Avengers, is on her own doing the PI thing on the left coast. Uh, just like she was during the last part of Fraction's run on Hawkeye, which was amazing. And this is very tonally similar. A lot of fun stuff. Um, some cool art layout things. Kate Hawkeye. And a massive Point Break reference. Which is all I need to be happy in the world is references to the real Point Break. The first one with Keanu Reeves and Gary Busey. Gary Busey! Utah! Give me two! <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, it's awesome. It's fun. It's, uh... Everything I wanted to read in a comic. Uh, it's got a lot of Veronica Mars overtones or undertones, as it were. And, yeah, that's that's it. If you're not familiar with Kate Bishop, you should totally check out either Fractions Hawkeye or the original Young Avengers run. Or, honestly, you could probably pick it up as you go reading this one. That's it. I think so. I think it's accessible to anybody that likes... Uh... PI type stories, yeah. or you know, she's she's young. I, I mean, she's got to be what, like in her early twenties. I mean, she can't. I would be amazed if she's yeah, much yeah. over twenty. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would I just find it odd that there might be. I guess Veronica Mars using that reference. Uh, she was pretty young when she was doing her PI. Thing. But, but she wasn't was a PI. Her dad was the right, licensed right. one. She was just subcontracting or working well, for him. She, she did get her license in the later seasons. She doesn't have show. a license. That's true. Unlicensed. Yeah, Licenses are expensive. Hawkeye number one gets a thumbs up from me as well. Um, can't say enough good things about it. You should totally check it out. It's got humor. It's got action. Uh, it's got a, an overconfident uh, <laughs> protagonist. And um, it's just good stuff. Uh, I, I had high hopes for this one, and I was not disappointed. And neither was Josh. Next up, Star Trek Boldly Go, issue number three by Mike Johnson and Tony Shastine. This continues the medi the first meeting of the Borg with the J.J. I shouldn't say the first meeting. This is... Uh, if you, you should go back, and if you haven't done so, this is kind of a sidebar here, and read, what was that called? The the pre the prelude or the the oh, prequel to the um, first movie. Nope. What was the first movie? Hero Nero no, was no, on the cover. Right, but it wasn't. There was a Nero storyline, which was its own thing, and then there was this setup to the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie that came out in two thousand. 2009 movie came out in 2009 um, but that s sets up a lot of stuff it was a comic book uh, prequel that really told you way more about the plot of the movie than yeah, the movie did it was essential as far as we were concerned <laughs> uh, going into the J.J. Abrams movie 
and we sold tons of copies because it was so important. So that gets referenced, and if you read that, you find out that there was a little bit of Borg interaction. Um, I'm stretching it a little bit. It's thin. But. Yeah, <laughs> there's a connection, I guess. But anyway, so the Borg and the J.J. Abrams crew uh, have a conflict in this, and you find out why the Borg are actually uh, on a mission here and what their mission is, and it ties back to the first movie. So this feels like it could totally be a Star Trek movie. This should be the next Star Trek movie. Everybody knows who the Borg are. First Contact was a, a huge financial success and critical success. We need, we need the Borg. Do this storyline. It is awesome. The Borg were in First Contact? Yeah. All I remember is the stuff in the past. Yeah, and the Borg <laughs> time traveled and changed a bunch of stuff. Okay. And, uh, Dum Dum Dugan was there. Yeah. And, but anyway. <laughs> and then Enterprise happened. I'm all over the place with this, but it's good. this series is not disappointing me at all. And I would totally pay to see this adapted for the screen. I think it would be great. Um, and it... Mike Johnson is such a capable writer when it comes to a Star Trek, probably a capable writer when it comes to anything, but he knows his stuff, uh, and so Star Trek fans, you should be reading this. Absolutely. Uh, next up for me begins the song of Brian Michael Bendis, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, number 15, although you might be confused by the giant number one on the cover, because this is the first part of Grounded, written by Brian Bendis, art by Valerio Shitty. And uh, the title is a bit of a misnomer because this is almost exclusively a Ben Grimm story. Uh, ben Grimm, the Thing, along with all the rest of the Guardians, is stranded back on Earth. And this is the story of him kind of trying to reacclimate into his life <coughs> in a world where Doctor Doom is a nice guy who is trying to be a hero, who's pretty and doesn't have a mask. And uh, Peter Parker owns the Baxter Building as part of Parker Industries. And Johnny Storm's running around with the Inhumans, and Reed and Sue are gone. Like, Ben's life doesn't really exist anymore, so this is about how he fits into the Marvel Universe. Uh, if you've read issue two of Infamous Iron Man, this ties into to that story, also written by Brian Bendis. And it was great. I, I was, I'm constantly amazed. We all know that Bendis can write. But I'm amazed by the, the breadth of things he can do. I mean, because this is basically a love letter to the 60s and 70s Fantastic Four stuff, and to the character of Ben Grimm. Uh, while at the same time advancing the plots of multiple different books going on in the Marvel Universe and the Guardians, obviously, especially. Just just great. Uh, you don't need to know anything about what's been going on in Guardians to check it out. If you're a Ben Grimm fan, you do not want to miss it. And I missed it originally, but now I will go back and read it because Ben Grimm is awesome. Last up for me, Wonder Woman number 12. Greg Rucka and Nicola Scott continue telling the new story of Wonder Woman Year One, and this is the second to the last issue. This has just been great from the get-go. I don't know what else to say about this. Nicole Scott's artwork is mm. jaw-droppingly awesome. Rucka writes Wonder Woman like no one else, and it, Rucka is almost the, the, the DC version of Bendis to some degree. He writes great dialogue, uh, and that's what this issue is almost exclusively made, made up of. There's very, there's very little action in here. It's a lot of talking, and that's great. And even Scott can draw that's people talking <laughs> and make it look super cool. And it's just to see Wonder Woman um, in her it, trying to, f to feel her way around this new world that she's in, mm -hmm. and it's set kind of in, in present day. Um, you just get to see so many of the qualities that make Wonder Woman admirable and make her a great character in this year one storyline. So, uh, yeah, get it. Get it! Uh, next up for me is Spider-Man number 10. This is a Civil War II tie-in written by Brian Michael Bendis, who you may have heard of, <laughs> drawn by Nico Leon, or Leon possibly, the professional. professional. <laughs> and uh, this is, I think, the last part of the Civil War II tie-ins for Miles, uh, I believe it is. But it is epic. Um, it is about the emotional fallout. I mean, obviously, if you're reading Civil War II, Miles is sort of a key to what's happening in the plot line at this point. Uh, and this takes us up just past the end of the previous, the last issue of uh, the, the most recent issue of Civil War II, where we see the conflict between Tony and Carol, and Steve and Miles are there as well. And this, we see the emotional fallout of that. And we don't know exactly what happens, because we won't see it until Civil War uh, Eight. But we see what it did to Miles, and we see him with like his closest friends talking about it, and uh, it's just really, really great soul-searching Spider-Man awesomeness. 
Yeah. All right, and now on to the things that are still great that we love. The Flash, number 12, is out this week, uh, continuing the Speed of Darkness storyline. Great interactions between Wally and Barry in this issue that you won't want to miss. Uh, Jessica Jones, number three, written by Brian Michael Bendis with art by Michael Gatos. Uh, we get to find out a little bit more about what's going on in Jessica's life and see kind of direction the book is taking. And, um, yeah, it's awesome. Also, you may notice there's a Hydra-looking thing on the symbol, which may come up. Inhumans vs. X-Men, number one, by Charles Soule, Jeff Lemire, and Laniel Yu. This was fun. This was, oh, not fun is the wrong word. This was, <laughs> uh, this was good. And the artwork by Neil Yu is always great to see. He did Secret Invasion, for those of you keeping score. This ha kind of feels a little bit like Ocean Eleven without the humor. Um, there's a kind of a... The X-Men are planning a heist, so to speak, but uh, you kind of get to see these different components ha happen as they're discussing them. It's just, I, I liked it. It was good. Awesome. Uh, Optimus Prime, number one, coming out of the Revolution stuff going on over at IDW, written by John Barber with art by Keizama. Uh, we get two stories, one in more or less the <coughs> present, we'll say, and then uh, the bulk of the story is four million years ago before the war between the Inhumans, and Inhumans, <laughs> sorry, uh, Autobots and Decepticons, when Optimus Prime was still just Orion Pax and a cop on Cybertron. So. Reborn issue number three is out this week, Mark Miller's outstanding story of what happens in the afterlife with artwork by Greg Capullo continues to be great. Next up we get Magic Bullets by, uh, is that a different barber? Oh, also also by John Barber, <laughs> presumably the same John Barber. We've got uh, Doctor Strange, Punisher, Magic Bullets, and it's a team-up book between Doctor Strange and the Punisher, and Doctor Strange has a magical shotgun on the cover, so I don't know what more I need to tell you about this book. Detective Comics, Victim Syndicate, Rolls On, written by James Tinney in the fourth, artwork by Eddie Barrows, which is all kinds of awesome, and I believe this is the second to the last part of this storyline, and things kind of go sideways for the Bat Family in this issue. Uh, Poe Dameron number nine. Poe Dameron's got to go undercover and get in touch with a spy network, and the spy master who he has to take with him and protect is C-3PO. If that doesn't sound awesome, I don't know what does. Green Valley number three by Max Landis and Giuseppe Camoncoli is out this week. A great underread book that needs to be read by all. And every issue does something that makes me think it's a different kind of story than the issue before it. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, there's a reveal here that takes it to a different level. So if you're not reading Green Valley, seek out the single issues. We just got, I think, a second printing of what? Two, two, and we still had some copies of the second printing of one. All right, so we have all three issues in stock. Come and get them. Yep. Uh, Red Hood and the Outlaws, number five, uh, is beginning the culmination of the conflict between uh, Red Hood, Artemis, uh, Bizarro, and the Black Mask. And it, uh, Scott Lobdell is not my favorite writer, but I love the way he writes Red Hood, <laughs> Jason Todd. And that's what this is. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Uh, the DC Rebirth Holiday Special is out this week. This is a big honkin' collection of holiday-themed stories featuring your favorite characters, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Detective Chimp. Uh, that story Harley. with Detective Chimp and Batman is good. It is. It's really good. The Flash, uh, and then who else? We get Batwoman, we get the Titans, we get the Green Lanterns, and it's kind of a bookended, but it's more than bookends. In between each story, we get a an ongoing framing sequence, framing sequence by Paul Dini, uh, featuring Harley Quinn, so this is totally worth your time this holiday season. Um, last up for me is Suicide Squad number eight. This is uh, sort of kicking off or setting up the beginning of Justice League versus Suicide Squad. Most of that setup is in the back, uh, the back matter, the, the backup story, not in the lead story. But uh, we start to see essentially the culmination of the crazy. Everyone in the Suicide Squad's going nuts because of Zod's power and and. The return of a character from previous issues, potentially. Yes. We'll see. All right. Tons of stuff. You may, If you watched our... Uh, well, you probably didn't, but you may have. Uh, we did kind of a preview <laughs> video uh, yesterday and mentioned how many books. I read 17 books. Josh read a ton of books. So many great stuff. The great things to choose from this week. So hit up your local comic shop. Show them your love during this holiday season. And if you're local, we hope to see you soon right here at Alter Ego Comics. And remember, we've got our 12 days of deals going on, plus a different trade paperback on sale for half off every day leading up to Christmas Eve. Thanks for watching. Give us a thumbs up if you like it. We're so out of time, but I feel I should mention these things. Thumbs up <laughs> on the video, subscribe, leave us questions in the comments below, and join the Comics Are Awesome private Facebook group where we can continue the conversation with you. See ya. Thank you.